coffee on this lovely rainy day. So nice to see all of you here. We have um, a great program. Our voter service is in charge today. And we're delighted to have Linda Roberts, our Marin County Registrar of Voters as our speaker. So as always, uh, for our Monday member meetings, I would love to hear from anyone who has an announcement from the committee or just an announcement in general. So if you have something you would like to share uh, with the members, please just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Nancy? Which Nancy? And oh, Nancy Bell. <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Uh, hi, I'm Nancy Bell, and along with Linda Sula, we co-chair the Climate Change Committee. And so the past year, we've been running the Climate Change Speaker Series, uh, bringing in top experts about climate change, its causes and impacts, and in the case of Marin, what are the biggest threats we have being wildfires, drought, sea level rise, and flooding. So we've covered all that information, as well as addressing what we can do locally in addressing these through uh, Drawdown Marin and climate action plans. Uh, now, but it's one thing to talk about what can be done, what are we actually doing? So for our November Climate Change Speaker Series, which will be Tuesday, November 16th at 11 a.m. on Zoom, we're going to be doing Marin's Climate Report Card. And we'll have representatives from several Marin towns report back to us what they are doing in regards to their climate action plans um, and the effects of those efforts. Is it working? Is it not working? Um, what challenges they're facing? And the panel will be moderated by Bob Brown. Uh, he is the former uh, director of um, the community development for San Rafael and basically the father of climate action plans in Marin. So check the chat for the registration link. Uh, there's also more detailed information uh, will be available on our website and the chat has the link to the climate change webpage. And of course you can always email me or Linda at climate at marinlwv.org, which is also in the chat. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the 16th. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Nancy. Any other announcements? I don't see any hands up. Okay, um, then I will turn this meeting over to Robin. Hi, everybody. My name is Robin Diedrich, and I have my email address in my um, my name here, just in case you have a question later. Um, the Voter Service uh, Committee is hosting today's uh, member meeting. So I thought I'd take a little bit of time to um, talk to you about some of the work we've been doing in 2021 and um, look ahead to 2022. So Many people think that in the odd number of years that it's an off years in elections. Well, that's actually not true. There's been a lot going on. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing. We've been educating voters for several of the special local elections, which are very important. We have a Tiburon election tomorrow for town council. So if you live in Tiburon, make sure you vote. Um, we worked very hard on the governor recall election, a very unique election um, and had its unique challenges. Um, we coordinated a candidate forum for the Tiburon Town Council race. Um, we worked on Voters Edge for all of the lo local elections. And we've been supporting the, the Marin County Student Elections Ambassador Program, as well as the Voters Choice Act um, implementation, which um, Linda Roberts will be discussing later. Um, I wanna take a couple of minutes to talk about voting rights um, at the state and uh, federal levels, just to acknowledge what's happening beyond our county lines. Uh, voting laws, both suppressing and increasing voter voting access are being passed across the country in response to the historic turnout of November 2020 presidential election, just about 364 days ago, which was massive, historic, and still in a lot of our minds about how much work went into that and how people really turned out and did whatever it took to get to the polls and to vote and everybody behind those um, efforts. 
Federal voting rights legislation is currently being hotly debated in Congress and across the country. The League of Women Voters is very involved in these efforts to pass legislation and has been, um, it, some of their work has included acts of civil, civil disobedience to raise awareness of this critical issue. Um, you can check the chat for our website link for more information. So I want to talk to you um, uh, about uh, what's coming up in 2022. And as I said earlier, there is no such thing as an off year in elections. However, um, uh, sorry, every year is important and brings its own unique issues, opportunities, and challenges. However, it is true that some election years have more contests on the ballot and so attract more interest. 2022 promises to be a busy and exciting election year in Marin County. There are two statewide elections scheduled, the June 7th primary election and the November 8th general election, with the possibility of many state and local contests and measures on both ballots. Additionally, new voting district lines will be in place as a result of this year's redistricting requirements based on the 2020 census. And we will be supporting our county's transition to a new election model as part of the Voters' Choice Act. And more on that from our Registrar of Voters coming up. There are many, many opportunities for League members to be involved, including leadership roles. Please reach out and find out more in the coming weeks. We will be putting links to information and contact email addresses in the chat for your use throughout this meeting. To help you start thinking about how you'd like to be involved in voter service this coming year, this slide has our teams with brief descriptions of their work and contact email addresses, which you will also find in the chat. So you can open up the chat box and um, you can copy from there or later on you can just copy the entire chat box if you like. By the way, this is a great time to start recruiting any friends who you think might like to join us to empower the voters of Marin County in 2022. We get a lot of new members in these um, big important election years. We're also putting a link in the chat that takes you to our league website information about our voter service work. So all of this information is also posted on our website. And I know because I work on our website and make sure it's all there. Okay, all our voter service teams are starting to plan for 2022. So please reach out now and in the coming weeks if you have any questions or are ready to commit to working on a particular team or teams. Be sure to bookmark our website, marinlwv.org and check it regularly for more information. Watch your inbox for e-blast with voter service information. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today's meeting, Linda Roberts, our Marin County Registrar of Voters. I'll tell you a little bit about Linda. Linda Roberts was appointed as Marin County Registrar of Voters on July 7th, 2014. Prior to this appointment, she was the, it's a very long name. <laughs> We're lucky we have just Registrar of Voters in Marin. A lot of other places have long names. Clerk Recorder, Registrar of Voters, Clerk of the Board of Supervisors in Mono County, California for seven years. She lived on the Big Island of Hawaii from 2005 to 2007 and worked in the development department at Parker School, a private K-12 college prep school. Her career in public service and elections started in Salt Lake City Municipal Government in 1977. Linda graduated from the University of Utah in 2005 with a Master's of Public Administration degree, where she also earned a bachelor's degree in fine arts. She worked for 14 years at the University of Utah in the Political Science Department as production manager of an international academic journal and department administrative assistant. Linda graduated from the Sam Rafael Leadership Institute and the Marin County Leadership Academy in 2017. She is also a member of the California Association of Clerks and Election Officials, a professional association. 
We really thank Linda for joining us today. Tomorrow is election day, but um, we're glad that she carved out some time to speak with all of us and share all this important information. I always love working with Linda. She's so calm and direct, and it just makes me feel so comfortable that she's in charge of our elections. Thank you for joining us, Linda. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for that. Um those kind words. I really appreciate it. And I'm really happy to be here today on this rainy, beautiful Monday talking about something I enjoy talking about, which is elections and the election department. So I have uh, three areas that I wanted to cover today. The first is going to be about the Voters' Choice Act. And then I want to recap the recall election and then lastly, if we've, if we've got time to just talk about some legislation that will be impacting election administration. So the first thing I'll do is share this, share the screen for my slides. And I need somebody to tell me, okay, are, are you seeing the, the full screen? Okay, okay. Yes, thanks. So as, as Robin touched on, um, we are implementing the Voters' Choice Act and League of Women Voters is always is a, is a great partner uh, to help with all kinds of things, including in this case, um, at some point we'll be doing direct outreach to voters. And so <clears throat> we look uh, forward to continuing to work with the League of Women Voters on this. So just some background information about the Voters' Choice Act. This bill, SB 450, was passed in 2016, and it allowed some pilot counties to implement the Voters' Choice Act in 2018. And the Voters' Choice Act basically does two big things. It, it allowed counties or it allows counties to conduct elections um, by sending all, all voters, all registered voters, a ballot in the mail. And it also replaces the traditional polling places with regional vote centers. And as you can see, there were five pilot counties that actually implemented this change in 2018, and included Madeira, Napa, Nevada, Sacramento, and San Mateo. And by 2020, fifth, there were a total of 15 counties that had implemented this act. As you can see in the map, those are the counties that are currently, they've been conducting elections under this model since 2020. And so for 2022, there are several counties that plan to implement this model, including Marin, but also Sonoma and Santa Cruz. So more counties are moving to this model. <clears throat> so basically, the vote by mail, um, well, let me back up. The, the legislation and the elections code, they outline formulas of, of what needs to happen when a county implements this act, this Voters' Choice Act. And so, as I mentioned, all active registered voters will get a ballot packet in the mail. Those are sent 29 days before an election. And so those of you who already vote by mail, you know what I'm talking about. Um, <clears throat> but there are formulas for the number of drop boxes that are required and the number of vote center locations. And so for drop boxes, we need to provide one drop box, secure drop box for every 15,000 voters. And so they, they are open starting 28 days before an election. And we find locations throughout the county for those drop boxes. And as far as the formulas for vote centers, um, there has to be uh, one vote center for every 50,000 voters that will be open starting 10 days before an election. And then we, we would open 14 more centers starting three days before an election. So our formula based on our current registration, uh, voter registration means we need a total of 18 locations that are strategically placed throughout the county. And there are services as I've, I've listed in these bullet points below, uh, what people can do. And a lot of it is very similar to what people can already do at a polling place. 
You can drop off a vote by mail ballot. You can register to vote and vote. Uh, at a vote center, people should be able to update their voter registration. That would be new. Um, and receive a replacement vote by mail ballot. That would be new. And then people concurrently vote using accessible voting equipment. And we'll have, <clears throat> we'll have instead of just one unit of accessible voting equipment, we'll have three. That's the minimum required for vote centers. I think probably one of the most exciting changes with vote centers is people can vote at any location. As you know, with the polling place model, people are assigned to a location, but because the uh, we'll have equipment now at vote centers that we can print whatever ballot a person needs and depending on where they live, then voters can go to any location to get their voter services. <clears throat> So when we're looking at locations, we need to consider several things. The uh, legislation outlined several things. And, it, and some of these include, as you can see, population centers, access to parking and public transportation, areas that have low vote by mail use. We need to make sure we focus a, a, a vote center location in, in those types of areas. And same with language minority communities low-income communities and areas that have uh, voters with disabilities. So we, we need to look at several things in the, that's, uh, that is listed in the statute, but also things that just of a practical nature that we'll be looking at will be the size of a location. We need to be able to accommodate voters and equipment and, and uh, vote center workers, whether, a locations will be available. We're, we're gonna have to take that into consideration because having multiple days, that's going to be a shift uh, in thinking for these locations, whether locations are accessible, uh, if they have computer connectivity, because part of what we'll be able to do is using a secure um, VPN network, be able to log into the voter registration system. And so we need to make sure that we're going to have good connectivity there. And then locations have to be secure or uh, have our ability to make sure we can secure them sufficiently during the time that they're serving as a vote center. And, you know, similar criteria for drop boxes. Will a location that we want to put a drop box be available and is it accessible and secure? So additional features that uh, were included with the Voters' Choice Act included uh, creating a language accessibility advisory committee. And so we have done that. And some of you may be aware we had, we've, we've had a project coordinator for two years who's been helping us put these pieces in place, Liz Acosta. And her, her work has pretty much ended at this point, but she got us really far along in implementing this change in this model. So I, I don't think she's here today, but I do want to just acknowledge the effort and the work that she put into this. So she was able to recruit a, uh, people for a language accessibility committee. We've got that committee in place. We've had a voting accessibility advisory committee in place since before I came. So I would imagine somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 years. So that committee's already been in place. And um, we, do, we do have committee meetings, um, usually after each major election, just to get feedback, to uh, find out from that committee, where can we improve what we're doing? That will be the same with the Language Accessibility Advisory Committee, just to keep us informed and aware of how we can best deliver services at these um, vote centers. And then the model, the new uh, vote center model also includes an increased public outreach and communication effort before each election. So that's another thing that Liz really helped with in connection, uh, conjunction with uh, Megan, who's on this call. I do want to acknowledge Megan uh, for the work she put in in the November 2020 election to help lay the groundwork for a network of community partners because this outreach, I think, will be key in just educating people about this new voting model. 
that is work that we will start after the first of the year as um, we don't want to start too soon before an election because people tend to forget. So we want to make sure that uh, we start this effort at, at a good time in the process so people it'll be fresh in their minds when they get ready to vote. And then uh, lastly, a big part of this implementation was an election administration plan. That is, that is something that Liz and I worked on I think starting in June, we started putting that plan together. It was it was a, a, a big document and had to go through several public processes to create the draft. And so uh, we were required to include, um, cons have consultation meetings with our disability community and our language minority community to get feedback about the plan to help us put together a draft before we took it to the public. So we actually had four consultation meetings, <clears throat> two with each group, uh, the disability community and language uh, um, minority community, as well as with the elections advisory committee that has been in place for a number of years, also before I started. So we we received really good feedback from these consultation meetings. And when we took it to the public um, on uh, September 30th for feedback, um, people had some good ideas about things that we could, that we could consider when we um, start to get the vote centers in place and open. Um, and overall, we got good feedback about the plan. So uh, then, the next step was to send that to the Secretary of State's office for approval, which they approved last week. So the plan is now ready to be the final plan to be posted on our website. The draft plan has been posted since mid-September. So we're coming to the end of, of this part and now can refocus on just the, the pieces that we have to continue to change our internally our procedures to implement to fully implement this plan. So how does all of this translate specifically to Marin County? <clears throat> so the Board of Supervisors in May, they adopted resolution 2021-33 supporting implementation of VCA. The board had been interested in this model for a couple of years. And so we'd been um, we'd been looking at what would need to what we need to do to implement and they had um, wanted us to have this in place for June of 2022 so we are on track to do that even though the recall election did present a challenge and some of our work had to be put on hold but um, we worked hard in advance of the recall to get as much implemented and, and done as we could before the recall election so so we have approximately 174,000 registered voters. So using those formulas for drop boxes and uh, vote center locations, what that would mean is that we would need to open four vote centers for a total of 11 days, uh, starting 10 days before the election and then on election day. And then uh, starting three days before the election, we would need to have a total of 18 locations open. So we'd have the four days, the four locations open initially, and then we'd add 14 more locations starting three days before the election. And then with the drop boxes, the formula uh, would be uh, 12 ballot drop boxes starting 28 days before the election. So if you think back to the November 2020 election and how that model, the model that we used for that election was really vote center like. There were just really a couple of things missing um, from what we did in November 2020. Uh, and one of that was the equipment to be able to print ballots on demand. So people were not able in 2020 to go to any location. We still had to assign locations because we did not have the ability to print the ballot type that any voter would need. So that was that was one thing we could not implement for 2020. But um, other otherwise, it was really it was really kind of a 
uh, an opportunity in disguise because it was uh, it was a lot before 2020 to to try to shift our model of how we did things. But um, I have to just say, and you may hear this from other registrars, but I have the greatest team in the world, and it it almost seems like they can just meet any challenge. Um, so we were able to accomplish that for 2020, which was really laid some great groundwork and gave us some practical experience for what the vote centers would look like and then just sort of implement those final pieces, you know, being open, having some of them open 10 days before the election versus just four, but then having the ability to print uh, any ballot type for voters. So 2020 um, did help. It was a scramble to, to get it all done. But there again, this is a great team. Um, they bring a lot of expertise and, and commitment and dedication to this work. So that is my overview of the Voters' Choice Act. I have listed some, um, a couple of links we do. We are starting to put information on our website as we go through this process. So you can go to our website and look for the link to Voters Choice Act. You'll see more information, or you can go to the Secretary of State's office, and they have they have a lot of information, and they have information that really pertains to other counties as well. So that is what I have for Voters Choice Act. So I'm going to stop here and see if anybody has questions about this. Um, Linda uh, K. Noguchi um, has a question. Um, she said, is a Dropbox more secure than the mail, the U.S. mail? Um, I would say a Dropbox could get it to us faster. We could get a ballot faster. I, I haven't seen any problems with the mail per se. Um, I really think it's just maybe voters choice what they're most comfortable with. I can tell you in November, the most popular drop box was our drive through box mm -hmm. at the Civic Center on Vera Schultz Drive, the, the northernmost archway. That people really liked that drive up box. So I think our um, our ballot box drop boxes did get a lot of action in November. And I think it just it was really just depending, I think, on personal choice. But um, it just might the ballot. We might get the ballot a day or so two earlier than through the mail. But um, I think they're both good methods for getting the ballot to us. Linda, this might be a good time to um, tell uh, the audience about uh, the ballot tracking. So where's oh. my ballot? And explain a little bit about how that. It gives a lot of people peace of mind. I know I signed up for all the notifications and I love getting them as I like that security measure. So um, maybe you'd like to explain that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Ballot Tracks, that's the name of the, the vendor that the Secretary of State is working with for this um, ballot ballot tracking system. And so we we signed up for that actually in March of 2020. And so we were already in place by November when it was required that counties offer a ballot tracking system. So we already had that in place. So it was nice to just have that piece done. But if you sign up and right currently we have about a third of our registered voters have signed up for that service. And it, it will send a message you, you, and you can ch uh, choose how you wanna get a message, email, text. It may offer phone calls. I, I don't, I can't remember all the choices, but yeah, you'll, just get, you'll just get a little message. Um, I, I chose text. So I get a little message that says, your ballot has been mailed to you. Um, and then when I get it back in the mail, it gives me a message that um, when the department, when the elections department has received it and that we're processing it, if there is a concern with it, let's say a voter forgets to sign their ballot envelope, then they'll get a message talking about um, telling them that there's uh, that it's been challenged. And I'm not sure all the details of the messages because I know the Secretary of State works to fine tune the messages so that they aren't confusing to people and that they make sense to voters statewide. Um, 
So it, it just kind of walks you through. And then when we've counted the ballot or we've we've processed it, it's good, it's going to be counted, then the voter gets a message that the ballot will be counted. So it's really a nice, a nice way to feel confident about where your ballot is in the process. And um, I I can't remember, did I already give you the um, the link to ballot tracks, Robin, that you could post in the chat? Um, I didn't see it, but we can certainly um, type that in. We have it on our homepage of our website, and I believe you also do yeah. at the marinvotes.org, the, the elections department. It's right on the front. It has the where's my ballot logo, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is the same as ballot tracks. I try to tell people that too, because they get surprised when it says ballot tracks. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. It's Thank you for thing. that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, people can go to our website or your website and find where's my ballot. There's a little icon. If you would like to check into it and sign up, it's really easy to sign up. So I do encourage you to do that as a way of just feeling more confident, especially for people who perhaps haven't been accustomed to voting by mail and may want to try it under this new model. Right. <laughs> okay, um, we have another question. Scott McCown said that the Voters' Choice Act seems to require more skilled staffing, and how is that going to be covered or yeah, planned for? We are currently, that's a, that's a big piece. You're absolutely right. And we are working with our HR department to figure out the best way to get those people that will need, uh, especially for that many days, uh, get them in the system to be vote center workers. But I think the other big piece will be training. And so we'll need to look at, at revising our current training uh, method to include probably more days or a longer day so that people can feel comfortable with the equipment. So you're absolutely right. It will take an, uh, more of an effort to get people up to speed so that they are com uh, confident with that equipment. Right. And then um, Greg Brock, thank um, you. have your hand up. Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Linda. Terrific, as always. Uh, having heard this many times before as an original 13 member of the Elections Advisory Committee and several times that long in the League of Women Voters, it never hurts to hear it again and again. And things change and you can never memorize it all, but we keep working on it. But anyway, uh, here's my question. That 87% figure that we already vote by mail sticks out. And there's some people, including on our committee, like Steve Silverstein, who've been advocating we should go to all US mail elections. Um, some states have done that. We do it in some elections. Um, have you seen any studies of any blowback but by states that have gone? And, and there's always some people, I like to go to my polling place, fine. And, and I sure saw it in the polling place a couple of months ago, but 13% in Marin, we get small, and maybe it'll be much smaller than that when we go to the vote center next year. At what point does the state say, okay, if you have so few, you can either reduce the number of vote centers because it's a useful thing, but and maybe more than you can handle in your office. But with everybody, more and more people voting by mail, even that incredibly complex but appropriately complex system, which were some ways more streamlined and some ways more complex, might become un unnecessary if we go to all US mail elections in the next five or 10 years. Have you seen any studies like that? Um I don't, I don't know that the state, I haven't seen anything that the state's moving away from in-person options. So, um, and I, and I don't tend to study a lot what's happening in other states. Cause I just, there's enough for me to really focus on what's happening in California. So, um, I would imagine an in-person option is going to stay with us for the foreseeable future. But to your point about the number of days that vote centers will be open. The initial vote center counties, there, there, there have been statistics. Um, I think an outside group has been following uh, voter behavior since counties moved to vote centers. And it is, it is evident now after a number of elections that people tend to show up right around or on election day still, even with these all this these multiple days open. And so that's what we found in November 2020 is we were open for a total of four days, three days plus election day. And there were a few people on the um, Saturday and the Sunday, a few more on the Monday, but the bulk of people showed up on election day. And so there is an 
usually our, our association of registrars, especially those who have been vote centers for a while, they will revisit that number of days and see if there's a way to get the legislation tweaked. Because I think now that we are going through more and more elections and showing that people just don't really show up in those six days before an election, that it seems reasonable to reduce that, but that would take legislation. And so there's an effort unto itself to get that to happen. But people do keep an eye on that. Thank you. Okay, and um, Nancy Bell had a question. Um, she mentioned that you talked about the use of the internet at vote centers. Um, and what about the actual ballots and how people vote? How will the votes be tallied? So maybe I think what Nancy's getting at is that the internet will be used, but then people are concerned about the vote, you know, the voting and the tallying. And is that connected to the internet for hacking security? So just to be clear, the... Um, Nothing's connected to the internet. Um, the com the checking computers, which will replace the ros well, the the sort of the roster that people sign now to polling place will be modified. So what what the workers will um, log into through this secure access. Um, network and we work with our, our IST to make sure everything is secure, but on the secure, the secure access to the voter registration records. That will allow a worker because now everybody is going to get a ballot in the mail. So we have to make sure that a person going into a vote center that we didn't already receive their ballot or they they thought it wouldn't be sent in time. So they're coming to the vote center. Um, being able to look at a person's voter registration history or voting history will allow a vote center worker to make sure that we haven't already received a ballot before they issue a ballot at the vote center. And so when the vote center worker issues a ballot at the vote center, that update happens in real time. So it will update that person's record that they got a new ballot at the vote center and then if their mail ballot is returned to us, it'll be kicked out and challenged. So um, that that's how that part will, will work. And then if a person uh, elects to vote that ballot and put it in the ballot box, what we'll, what we'll do each, each night after the vote center closes is those ballots will be brought back. Just like on election night, what we do now is after the poll workers close the polling place, the ballots are gathered up and and reconciled. They, they count how many ballots were voted, how many, um, in this case, it would probably just be how many ballots were voted and people will sign, they'll still sign um, a little printout that they voted, but those ballots will come back to our office every night after a vote center closes so that we can store them securely in a locked and alarmed area uh, and then we will count them here centrally, like we've been doing since we got the new voting system in 2019. Did that completely answer the question? Yeah, I think um, Nancy wanted to give you the opportunity to explain something about the security and the internet there. And then um, Becky Beignet, you have your hand raised. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, um, thanks, Linda. Linda just pretty much answered the comment that I was going to make that I think a lot of voters in this day and age are concerned about fraud and, and security. And so Linda just addressed that nicely. And I think you might also want to make mention of the, um, the LNA steps that you take to make sure that our voting processes and our computers are working appropriately. Oh, thank you for that, Becky. Um, so just to reiterate, none of the voting system here is connected to the internet. It's all standalone. And, and that when I talk about the voting system, I talk about um, the system that creates the ballots and tallies the ballots, that, that whole system. And so what we do before every election is run what's called a logic and accuracy test on the equipment that will be actually tallying the ballots to make sure that it is doing its job correctly. And so we have, we have a, a deck of some pre-marked ballots 
And so that we know what the pattern is supposed to be. So when we run the, the report after we run those test ballots through, we can see that the machines counted the ballots correctly. And so that's something that we do every election. And uh, we have um, outside people come in. We, I always invite people from the grand jury, the grand jury association and from the League of Women Voters. And I want to thank all of you who have participated in that process over the years. We've had many from League of, of Women Voters and you're very integral part of that process, especially when we get um, observers, outside observers like we did for the September election. And we can we can say, here's the process. And these external people are overseeing this process. It just really helps with the transparency. So that process lets us know that the ballot equipment is counting correctly. And then um, that test is zeroed out and we have the, the LNA, the Logic and Accuracy Board members, view the report and, and acknowledge that yes, it's all zero. And so when we start to count the actual official ballots, then, then we know that it's not, it, that it's counting starting from zero. So that's how we um, operate those, those tests before each election. Okay, and then Nancy had, Bell had one more follow-up question. She said, as you mentioned, in the foreseeable future, people will still be able to vote in person. At the same time, my understanding is that all registered voters will receive a ballot in the mail. Um, is that correct? So whether they vote in person or use that ballot, they'll all get one. Initially. That that is correct, and and now under the under the current polling place model, it's really pretty similar. If a person gets a ballot in the mail, but they want to vote at their polling place, they can take their ballot to the polling place and surrender it. Um, maybe a better way of saying that is they can give it to the poll worker, and they can get a ballot that they can vote at the polling place. Under vote centers, it will be the same. Um, yes, everybody will be sent a ballot in the mail. If they choose not to vote that ballot and they want to go to their vote center, the other uh, convenient thing about the vote centers and the fact that we can look up a person's voter record is that if they don't have that vote by mail ballot with them, then we can see that it, we haven't received it so we can issue a ballot and that will help reduce the number of provisional ballots because sometimes people just forget to take that ballot with them and then they have to vote provisionally. Right. So you can also you mark it out that that the vote by mail ballot is not being used and they're mm -hmm. going to be voting at the vote center so that they can only yeah. only vote one time. Right. Right. OK, well, why don't we those seems like those are most of the questions. I don't see any. Buddy, I can't really see anyone, so um, I don't see any more questions. Does anybody else see any more questions at this time? We can answer more later. So I've exited out of, exited out of my presentation, and I'm just sorry about that. <laughs> gonna, uh, and so I'm just going to talk to you now. Um, okay. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was just a recap of the recall election, and. Um, give you some perspective on why that was such a challenge. Um, so the election was called by the Lieutenant Governor on July 1st, as we know, uh, for September 14th. And that gave us 75 days to prepare for an election. And that may sound like a lot, but what we, what we generally do six to 12 months before any election, we have our polling places reserved, six to 12 months before an election. And then about three months before an election, we have started recruiting poll workers. So probably I would say the biggest challenge we had preparing for that recall election was getting our polling places and our poll workers in such a short time frame because we, we really didn't have 75 days to get them. We had we had to account for the training that people would need. And we have to get the, the voter information guide in the mail. It's typically 40 days before an election, but we had to push it a little bit closer because of this shortened time frame. And so we really had just a matter of a few weeks to get all of those pieces in place so that when we 
sent the voter guides in the mail, we could print a person's polling place on the back cover. So it was really a scramble and a challenge. And we had a team, at least a couple people who spent two weeks all day, every day for two weeks calling polling places and um, calling the chief poll workers who then were asked to call their clerks. And so that effort was really, it really paid off. People were so um, cooperative to just at the last minute like that, you know, say yes, we'll be a, a polling place. And, and it was just the one day election day polling place. So that may have made it a little bit easier too, but we were able to get 70 polling places and all the poll workers we needed. So it, it all worked out because I think there again, it's a very cooperative um, effort to run an election. You know, we there's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of people that we rely on for their help. And so the community does step up. The community of uh, locations that have, have been a poll, polling place in the past, poll workers that have done their jobs in the past. But it was really, it was stressful, I will say. It was stressful to try to plan a major election like that in 75 days. Um, the other thing that was um, a challenge is that we received the list of candidates for the recall election seven days later than normal. So that delays how soon we can get started putting the ballot together. <clears throat> and that impacts being able to contact our military and overseas voters to give them the ballot and the information they need to so that they can have, have enough time to vote. And, um, and also getting the ballot to our vendor uh, to, to print the ballot and get it in the mail on time. There was no change in the deadline on getting the ballots in the mail. Uh, those still had to go out 29 days before that election, which was August 16th. So we, we were pushed really hard to get this work done in a shortened amount of time. And then lastly, another challenge was just to get the voter information guide put together in such a quick turnaround. We can typically start when we have the election, the date of the election, we can start getting our voter information guide cover put together weeks or months before, before these, these other deadlines start happening. But we didn't know. We, had, we knew it was coming, but there's a degree of anxiety when you don't know the date that you have to plan a major event. And so, you know, as soon as we got the date, we were able to start things happening. But um, so those those were really challenges um, in the first part of the process to get set up. And then, you know, there are times later in the process when things start to happen. So it kind of smoothed out. But Initially, it was it was really a challenge and, and pretty stressful to get going. It was such a short amount of time. So I wanted to give you some statistics. Um, I think I like numbers, and so I like to give numbers to people. Um, so for the for the recall, the number of registered voters we had was um, almost one hundred seventy four thousand, and our votes cast in that election, uh, 100, a little over 133,000. That was uh, over 76% uh, we had in turnout and we ended up being the highest in the state. And uh, we had 5% of our people voted at the polls and that was a little over 6,000 people. And then the majority of people, 95%, almost 127,000 voted by mail. And what I noticed in looking at a, a breakdown by uh, the cities and towns and the unincorporated parts of the county is that our turnout countywide and in these um, jurisdictions, I thought it was really pretty high. It was, it was anywhere from 73 to 80% turnout. So in, in the various jurisdictions and the unincorporated part of the county. So to compare that, with the 2018 gubernatorial election cycle. In uh, the June primary of 2018, we had 100, uh, about 155, uh, 500 registered voters. So, you know, almost 20,000 fewer 
than we had for the recall. We had almost 87,000 votes cast. Turnout uh, for that June 2018 primary was 56%. And in that election, we were number 10 in the state for turnout. And then 74% voted by mail and 26% voted at the polls in that June primary. In the November general 2018 election, the uh, registered voters went up from the primary. It was, uh, it was over 100, um, near 161,000 registered voters, 132, um, voted uh, 132,000 votes were cast. Our turnout in the November 2018 election was 82%. We were number two in the state in that election. And we were barely away from number one by about a third of a percent. So we were just kind of edged out. And then in that November 2018 election, 73% voted by mail and 27% voted at the polls. I, I found it really interesting just to see the difference in the number of people that voted by mail and the number that voted at the polls in the recall. And so it's hard to say if that's still a function of the, the continuation of COVID. Um, it was actually fewer people voted at the polls in the recall than during the November 2020 election. So I found that to be really interesting. And so that was just kind of a quick overview of the recall. Um, so before I go into this last part, did you have any questions for me about the recall election? You know, I don't see any in the chat right now, um, but I'm curious um, from our voter education standpoint, we were scrambling as well, <laughs> um, trying to help people know what to do. And as you were figuring out what was happening and us, mm -hmm on your heels and we appreciated all of the assistance that you gave us really helped. Um, but we had a lot of people just trying to understand mm. the ballot. Mm -hmm. Could I vote one part, not the other? If I vote one part this way, can I, do I have to vote the other? You know, two questions only, but it was more complex, which really kept people, I think, I was afraid would keep people from voting. And I felt like overall that, our state, everyone, the elections departments and the voter education groups really did a great job of explaining that, I thought. Um, but how did you deal with that in your office? I know we directed people to contact you. We really want you to be the official resource and you had a phone line. Did you get a lot of calls about how to vote the ballot? I, I think so. And because I don't, I don't, take those calls, I, I don't really know. I know calls were coming in and I know um, Megan was using the Secretary of State's toolkit to put out on social media on our Facebook to help educate people. But um, Megan is on the line and maybe you can give us some insight about the number of phone calls. If you recall how many phone calls we were getting from people that were confused about voting in the recall. Do you have some idea, Megan? Yeah, um, I would say we did get a significant amount of calls asking about how to vote the ballot, um, but we did get, uh, I remember before we brought in um, people for our phone support team who answered those voters calls, um, we created like a frequently asked questions based off um, an FAQ sheet from the Secretary of State's website, and it was basically to answer those basic questions, excuse me, questions about how to answer, um, like how to vote the ballot, and then general things about like um, basically all recall related questions. So we just gave that to our, our phone support team and they were able to uh, give a uniform answer to all voters who called. And then if those weren't sufficient, they would direct them to the Secretary of State's website. But it seemed like everyone's questions from when I was answering the phone were very consistent, like, you know, basic questions that I'm sure the league saw too about how to vote the ballot. And then it we could give them a quick, simple answer and they were ready to go. And I actually noticed as we got closer to the election, those questions kind of dropped off. So I think as um, like the, the media news and social media uh, was putting out a lot of content about how to vote the ballot, I think people were looking for finding alternative resources on where to find information. So um, as a whole, yes, we did get a lot of calls, but I, I, don't think that it maybe really deterred a lot of people from voting. I think that they got their questions, uh, they got their questions answered where they needed to get their answer uh, questions answered, and then they voted. So, 
it was a pretty um, good turnout for for a confusing ballot. Thank you, Megan. And, and we did add information in, a, in the voter guide trying to, to really simplify that to help people. So we did what we could in that short period of time to try to get that message out. But when we were when we were preparing ballots, taking them out of the uh, envelopes to get them ready to count, we did not see a lot of problems on these ballots that people looked like they had been really confused. Um, they were actually, we saw very cleanly voted ballots and thought, well, maybe it's because it was such a small ballot that it was just, you know, easier to deal with and, and people didn't feel so overwhelmed by a two sided 18 inch ballot. Right. And um, we did get one uh, quick question. If do you know how much it cost Marin in particular to participate in the recall or portion of the costs? I, yes, I had to do a, a preliminary sort of a, an approximate cost of, of what we would spend. And so I, I did that months before the recall. But um, the number that I gave them was about $1.6 million. And that included, we were able to include the cost of actually checking signatures on the recall petitions. And so, um, so that's what we got reimbursed for. And, and what we'll be doing now is we'll be actually going through and reconciling that approximate estimate, that estimate, um, about uh, against our actual cost and if it if it comes in that i estimated a little bit high we'll be able to just keep that money and apply it to the next election in june so um it'll be interesting to see actually what the cost came in at i anticipate it to be fairly close to that 1.6 million dollars mm -hmm. and where does that reimbursement money come from Oh, the state, the state reimbursed us. Great. So the legislature, when they were passing different legislation having to do with this election, they built that in. Right, right. Well, speaking of the legislature, maybe you'd <laughs> like to go ahead and tell us a little bit about some of the um, laws that um, have uh, passed just this. Summer. Yeah, there's actually three that I wanted to touch on that really, that impact election administration. Uh, the first one is Assembly Bill 37, and what that does is it really carries forward legislation that was approved in 2020 and 2021 to deal with the COVID circumstances. And so Assembly Bill 37 will make it permanent, quote unquote permanent, that all registered voters will be mailed a ballot. 29 days before an election. And that so um, it doesn't matter now if a county is a, a vote center or a Voters Choice Act county or not. Every county will be required under this legislation to mail their registered voters a ballot. And it, the in person voting still applies. It's very clear in that legislation that people will still be able to choose if they want to to vote at a polling place, a satellite office, or a vote center. So that doesn't change. The counties will still be required to provide ballot tracking and we're already in place with that. So we won't have to do anything on our part. It's already in place. Other than we do, we do still promote um, that uh, ballot tracks or where's my ballot. So people are aware of it so they can sign up. Another thing this bill will do that was allowed under the 2020 and 2021 elections is that any any voter will be able to use the remote accessible vote by mail. This system had been in place for a number of years for military voters and overseas voters. And remote accessible vote by mail is um, it's, it's set up so that a, a voter who requests who requests to vote that way. And voters who are already military or overseas and have already requested that they get the email, uh, the information by email, it's just automatic. But other voters can request to get, to get the link they need to access the, their ballot and then they can mark it on the computer. I need to stress, this is not internet voting. 
and I want to stress it again, this is not internet voting. So people can open their ballot, they can mark it and print it, and they have to mail it back to us. So people have to be able to print the ballot and, and uh, otherwise the system won't work for them. But so all voters will have access to that under this new legislation. And then uh, <clears throat> a ballot will be timely cast if it's postmarked on or before election day and we receive it seven days after the election. That's been in place for the 2021 elections. That's what was in place for the recall election. The old law was, uh, it had to be postmarked timely and we had to receive it three days after the election. In 2020, the law was tweaked to say, we had to receive it 17 days after the election. And so for 2021, they pulled it back to seven days, which I think is very reasonable. There was one election that I can't remember which one it was. It may have been the 2018 elections that we received ballots the Monday following the election that they were timely postmarked, but because we had in, in that election passed, we had to receive them within three days. We couldn't count them. So I think seven days is very reasonable. And I'm really glad about that so that we can just have that extra time to get ballots that were perhaps mailed from a different state and they're just you know taking their time to get through to us <clears throat> and then this legislation will allow processing ballots starting 29 days before an election we've we've been able to process the envelopes which means we could run them through our sorter we could check them in we could verify signatures but w the law had had changed a couple times about when we could actually start pulling the ballots out of the envelopes. In 2020, I think it was, well, there was legislation passed that allowed us to start doing it 15 days before an election. And then for these recent elections, we were allowed to do it 29 days. Well, this new law, it codifies that, that we'll be able to start actually processing ballots getting them out of the envelopes, getting them ready to count 29 days before an election. And that too really helps us because the more that we can get out of envelopes and ready to count, the more we have to report on election night. So I think really Assembly Bill 37 does some beneficial things for voters and for election administrators. And then Senate Bill 35, that expands electioneering laws and does it, um, does a few new things. It it expands what's considered a prohibited activity. You know, now people they can't um, they can't wear buttons and they can't talk about issues, measures, or candidates on the ballot a hundred feet from the polling place. They can't circulate petitions and things like that. Well, this new law now makes it uh, prohibits uh, obstructing ingress, egress, and parking. And these prohibited, including the current activities plus these new prohibited activities are not, not allowed within 100 feet of the entrance to the building with the polling place. So for example, people can come into our office to vote. Well, they can, they can get a, a vote by mail ballot, but let's say we were a polling place where people could vote and put their ballot in a drop box. It would be now 100 feet with this new legislation from the entrance to where people would come in the building to access our office. So that really extends this zone, neutral zone, much further than it has been. And as far as uh, outdoor sites where a voter might drop off a ballot, maybe there's curbside voting or we have a ballot box, this law also um, makes it illegal to do any of these prohibited activities with a, in 100 feet of these external locations. A another interesting thing that it does is makes the prohibited activities are not allowed in the immediate vicinity of a voter in line. So if we had a, a vote center or a polling place that people were in, in line and it was extending out, I'm not sure this would happen in Marin County, um, but let's just say a polling place had a line and um, so prohibited activities could not be done near where people are waiting in line. It doesn't specify how far 
that um, immediate vicinity is. So we may get some directions from the Secretary of State. They might write some regulations about this, but it just says immediate vicinity of a voter. And then we'll be required with the Secretary of State's assistance to notify the public about these prohibitions on electioneering. And lastly, one of the things this new legislation does is it imposes a penalty of $1,000 or imprisonment for 16 months to three years if a person displays a ballot drop-off container with the intent to deceive voters and directs a voter to place their ballot in an unofficial container. So really, I think there are some benefits to this new legislation in that it, it expands the restricted zone so that hopefully voters will, you, you know, it, potential for voter intimidation. It just expands that zone so that if something occurs and we can then have this legislation to stand on to uh, prohibit people from doing these certain activities. And then lastly, it looks like I'm getting down to just a few minutes here. Lastly, Senate Bill 503 talks about signature verification on ballot envelopes. And it really, it really just codifies um, what we've been doing as far as our diligent efforts to check signatures. It um, specifies that we presume that the signature on the envelope is the voter signature. Exact match is not required. It just needs to have similar characteristics. And um, the Secretary of State has regulations to which we can refer to help explain discrepancies. There may be discrepancy in a signature on file with a ballot signature due to age, but we can detect enough of a, a comparison that we can count that. And then we only reject a ballot signature if, if two elections officials have determined beyond a reasonable doubt that there's just not enough uh, similar characteristics to count that ballot. And then we send a letter, which all of this we've been doing in practice. Uh, the letters have been required for a number of years, but we send a letter. It specifies the next business day if it's, if it's practical to do so, but if not, then as soon as possible. So those are the three pieces of legislation that we will be implementing um, or it, it gives us a, a framework of, of enforcement if we need to rely on something. So, so that's all I had for legislation and that really is the end of what I had planned to talk about. So now I'm just open for questions specifically or in general. Great, yeah, Kay Noguchi had a question. <laughs> she asked, if you're on vacation, can you access getting a ballot online? The remote accessible vote by mail. Oh, thanks for bringing up that question because actually I was going to point out uh, the benefits of that for people. And I'll give you an example of um, first responders that may have been called out to work on a wildfire out of county. They would have access to the remote accessible vote by mail. A person who can't get to their polling place or maybe they didn't get their ballot in the mail and they, like you say, they're out of the county for a period of time. So remote accessible vote by mail will be handy for people there again, as long as they can print the ballot, print their marked ballot and get it postmarked on time so that we can count it. So those, um, the printing is key as well as getting it in the mail timely. So I'm sorry, did you mention, does there have to be a reason why, like, is there a qualifying reason? Like if you go on vacation, could you do something like that? Um, I, it, all the law says is that anybody can request, use the uh, remote accessible vote by mail. Great. Okay. So, you know, um, the, I know people were applying, I think there's a form, they were finding a form on the uh, Secretary of State's website, or they would call us and ask about it. And so we, it just says anybody can use that. They can okay. request a ballot using remote accessible vote by mail. Great. And Joan Brown had a question. She said, with ballots counted in advance, I mean, this is something that you already do with your equipment. I know 
you can answer the question about certain types of equipment, but with ballots counted in advance, how do you keep confidentiality of how the votes are trending, et cetera? So basically getting those preliminary results, how do you keep them secure? We don't release anything. Um, we don't look at it or release it. It's just, it's just um, stored away in its, mm -hmm. its piece of the software. And um, we just keep accumulating the ballots until after, well, 8 p.m. on election night, and then we run a report. Okay. So, so nothing is released until um, election night. Okay, great. And then um, let's see, uh, there's a question. Um, what, if any, challenges are presented um, to election administration in the use of ranked choice voting? Um, so if if ranked choice voting you know, were to be considered in our county, what would be some challenges presented to you as an election administrator if we decided to, to use ranked choice voting? I think probably um, having to learn how that model works. And, and we, and you probably know this, but we can't implement that unless the state gives that direction to go forward with ranked choice voting. I think I think some cities and I know San, I think San Francisco does it. I think maybe Oakland because they um, they do it for local elections and they have um, I think charter cities or charter counties can do things a little bit differently. But we would have to learn how to um, how to use that model. So I guess I don't know what I don't know at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, the challenge would be that you'd have to figure out uh, how the, your um, your voting systems, how they work, can it accommodate that? What would yeah. need to happen to yeah. that? Would all have to be explored, right? Um, prior, yeah. yeah. But you're saying that as a county, we couldn't have a measure to do it just for our county because of the type of county we are. I, I don't think so. I, it's my understanding that just charter cities and counties can do that. Um, okay. I haven't really explored it. I have to say I haven't, I haven't explored it um, because I know we can't do it statewide um, and it hasn't really come up for uh, local, um, but I, I don't, I don't think we can. Okay. Um, Ann Wakely, you want to ask a question? I just want to say, I think you're right, Linda. Thank you. Um, and Kay Inuguchi had a follow-up question to that ex remote accessible ballot. Um, she said, is it just sent in a regular envelope? I think what she means is when you send back here. When you send it back. Um, what, what the system provides is, um, I, I believe people get the, the image of the envelope that they can print and then they can tape it to a regular envelope. Um, or I do know for sure there are instructions to tell you how to send it back. Now there again, sometimes I don't I don't um, drill down on some of these details. Um, Megan, if you know the answer to that, please mm -hmm. feel free to chime in on that envelope part of the remote accessible vote by mail. Yeah, absolutely. Linda's right that uh, with your ballot, we, we send an email through our vendor when you request an REVBM ballot remote accessible vote by mail ballot. Um, and uh, you get your ballot, you get the instructions on how to vote and return it. And you do get a uh, like label that has all the information we need to count your ballot that you can print out and then place on a standard envelope. Um, we even tell voters if they uh, are not able to print that, some of the other information we really need from you is mostly just to print your name, sign your name and then write ballot and close on the outside of the envelope. Those are the most important parts. Um, but we do provide that um, pre-printed label that has the you know, a correct address to send to and all of that. So it's pretty straightforward, but um, it's an education for us and for voters as we transition to this more regularly. Thank you, Megan. Right, and I'm sure you, I know you have it on your website because I scour your website constantly learning new things and I'm, I know that it's, it's on there as well. I, I, I also don't know the details that I've never done it personally, but um, that will be an interesting new option. Well, we don't have any more questions right now unless I'm missing anyone's hand up. 
Uh, Annie Laser, would you like to ask a question? Annie, we're not hearing you. Hmm. Still not hearing you, Annie. Um, I had a question in the chat. And I don't know if it. Oh, it, sorry, I missed it. It ended up uh, being uh, rem remembered in the chat. I wondered uh, whether the places that you use as as uh, of, of voting centers or whatever vote centers, do you ever have to pay the owners of of those places for you taking over? The, part of their building we anticipate that yes it'll be it'll be similar to what we do with polling places we pay polling places now so you and, and place. okay. part yeah we pay polling places and when we when we extended the voting in november 2020 to uh three days plus election day we paid those locations so mm -hmm. i anticipate that yes there will be some sort of remuneration for the use of their space Oh, good. Thank you. So we're just about the end of our meeting here. And I just wanted, um, before we finish it up, I wanted to um, note that today is um, a national civic holiday, election hero day that was started <laughs> last year when I think people across, well, I know people across the country, including myself, um, realized how important um, election workers at all levels are. And we are still learning that because there are still these issues that we have um, you know, across the country about voting and people are really learning a lot. And I've noticed that your um, office is really being, I mean, you've always been transparent, but just really going out of your way to be more transparent and to uh, welcome everyone to understand the election process. And I think as everyone learns more, we become more and more appreciative of the fantastic work that you do and how it is a fundamental part um, of our democracy. And so we just wanted to acknowledge and thank um, our very own Marin County election heroes today, um, Linda Roberts, our registrar of voters, as well as your staff at the elections department. And um, later on today, we'll be delivering a thank you poster, a card and some treats for all of you. And if people here want to um, do their own thanks to maybe your neighbor or friend or someone you know who's a poll worker, thank your mail carrier, thank um, the elections department, give them a call or send them a note. I'm sure they'd love to get that um, appreciation um, or just an understanding of what they do and how important we are. So if you want to unmute and do um, an audio clap, you're welcome to, or put your little clap signal um, in the corner of your, um, your uh, picture, you're welcome to do that as well. And I just want to thank you so much, um, Linda, for today and for everything in your whole department. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you. And thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you for that. You know, that sort of positive recognition just it really it really is like just no pun intended here with the vaccine, but a shot in the arm for <laughs> for the department. And, you know, just reminds us this is really, really important work we do. And sometimes we maybe hear from the people who are really concerned and and we love hearing from people who just feel confident in what we do. So thank you so much for that. Uh, you're very, very welcome. And so we will be letting you get back to that. But I want to let everyone know before we actually let Linda go that we're going to pull up that slide again with our voter service teams after so that we can, I'm going to run through them. Um, and just if people have any questions about that while we have everyone here, because um, I actually had the slide up, but I didn't say a whole lot about it. So I'm going to do that. But Linda, we know you have an election tomorrow. And so we want to um, let you go. And I know you're also always very good about an, um, answering any questions. So if we get any later on that we're not able to answer, um, then we will check in with you and get those okay. answered for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Linda. So, um, Lynn, do you want to pull, can you pull up that slide one more time? Um, I just wanted to run through that we have the voter registration um, team and voter education and outreach. We're sort of pulling um, 
these things out a little bit differently than we had a little bit in the past, we're putting, um, that will be our get out the vote efforts and we'll be working a lot on the Voters' Choice Act um, with that, as well as the actual information that we get out to the community. Um, the youth outreach, we're gonna, actually we have so much going on with youth that we're gonna um, do some of that, the election ambassador program, and then some other work that we're doing with youth in Marin County. The candidate forums, you all um, have, many of you have participated in that. Um, we need some help with organization and um, also the actual moderator team roles, uh, pros and cons. A lot of people just love doing the research for the state propositions. Um, and then um, the presentation, some people do one um, or both of those. And then uh, Voters Edge, our statewide um, league uh, voter education uh, website. And Becky Beignet is leading that now. And um, that takes a little bit of you know, di digital communication and data entry, but there is training involved. And Becky is ready for anyone even right now to get going on that because it does take a little bit of time to get comfortable with it. So if anybody has any questions, I'll stay on for a little bit here, or you can always go to my um, email address, voterservice at marinlwv.org and my name right there. And we will, um, get you the answers to any questions you have. And we're looking forward to working with everybody um, in 2022. And please reach out before if you have any questions or want to tell us that you're ready to start. Thank you. Um, and Anne, if you want to. I just want to thank everybody for being here today and thank the voter service team for a really excellent program. Uh, that was terrific. Really, it's always nice to hear from Linda Roberts. 